We've been talking about on Sunday morning for the last couple of weeks about how to have deeper relationships. How all of our relationships can have more meaning and be more significant to us and be what God wants. God has a, a desire for the quality of our relationships. And it takes deep, digging a little deeper at times. And certainly when it comes to communication is what we're going to talk about this morning. It takes deeping dig into who we are and deeping dig into the heart of God. The title, Seven Easy Steps to Great Communication, is my attempt at sarcasm. And oftentimes when we struggle with communication, we want someone to give us the easy way out. Just tell me what to say. Give me seven easy steps or three easy steps or one easy step to great communication. And, and communication really is deeper than that. Because communication comes from who we are. It's not simply what we say. It's a matter of who we are. In our text this morning, it is Matthew chapter 12. It is that text where Jesus is doing amazing things. He's casting out demons. He's healing people. He's bringing about real change in people's lives. If somebody... If somebody were doing things like that today, if, if someone was healing, casting out demons, we would at least think this person is operating from a power beyond ourselves. And we would probably say it was a benevolent power. Somebody who has power with good intent is at work in this person who's doing these good things. But the Pharisees, do you, do you remember what they say about Jesus and what's happening here? He's, they say that he's working from the power of, of the devil. Why did they say that? Because it's something that comes from their belief system. It comes from deep within who they are. This is what they believe. And so because of that, they can't distinguish between good and evil, between right and wrong. And Jesus argues the point with logic and with a warning. The logic is, don't be ridiculous. A house divided against itself cannot stand. And if this is Jesus doing good by the power of evil, it doesn't make sense. It's illogical. And then he gives a warning to them. And the warning has to do with what we say. And the warning has to do with what they're saying. That if that they can speak against other human beings and and maybe even the things of faith, and those those misspeaks will be forgiven. But if you misspeak against the Holy Spirit, it won't be forgiven. So Jesus is saying, be careful what you say about God. Be careful what you believe about God, because what you believe is going to come out in what you say. Is that not true? That's our point this morning. What we believe is going to come out in what we say. And Jesus goes beyond just talking about the Holy Spirit. He's warning us in Matthew chapter 12, watch your words. Not just about this, but in everything that you say. We'll pick up in verse 33. Either make the tree good and its fruit good, or make the tree bad and its fruit bad. For a tree is known by its fruit. Brood of vipers, how can you speak good things when you are evil? For the mouth speaks from the overflow of the heart. 
A good man produces good things from his storeroom of good. And an evil man produces evil things from his storeroom of evil. I tell you, on that day of judgment, people will have to account for every careless word they speak. That gives me concern for myself. That God takes serious the words that I speak. And Jesus is trying to tell us here that those words... Our problem isn't communication or that we're not communicating. Our problem is we've got bad communication and it's coming from, it's coming from somewhere. And Jesus is telling us it's coming from inside of us. Verse 36 again, I tell you that on that day of judgment, people will have to account for every careless word they speak. For by your words, you will be acquitted. Or by your words, you will be condemned. It's kind of like this poem. A careless word may kindle strife. A cruel word may wreck a life. A bitter word may hate and still. A brutal word may smite and kill. A gracious word may smooth the way. A joyous word may light the day. A timely word will lessen stress. A loving word may heal and bless. Our words can either bring about good or they can bring about evil. And depending on what's inside is what is going to happen on the outside. What is inside is going to come out. The preface to good communication, Jesus tells us in verse 33 of our text. And in this, in this passage, he's saying, make a decision. Make a decision about who you are. Or understand who you are. A good tree has good fruit. A bad tree has bad fruit. And he's making that statement to get us to think about who are we. And he's trying to encourage us to make that decision. How are you going to live your life? What is going to be recognizable in your life? What truths are defining your life? Make a decision. Are your words going to define and reflect who you are? One of the elements that underline who we are is the Holy Spirit. We're having this class in room number four on Sunday morning, and it's really challenging us because Ray's talking about things that are deeper than we usually like to go. To understand that no good thing happens in a Christian's life outside of the power of the Holy Spirit, that's challenging. But it is the Holy Spirit that is trying to create within each one of us a new version of humanity. And one of the elements that Galatians chapter 5 talks about that reminds us of what the Spirit is trying to create in our lives is self-control. And I want us to think about this concept of self-control as it relates to how we communicate. Sometimes people have this dumb discussion about, if you could have a superpower, what superpower would you have? You know, would you be like Spider-Man or would you be like Superman or, you know, what would be the superpower that would define your life that you think would bring things together? Our superpower is self-control. The element that will change many things in our lives is this superpower of self-control. And it is a superpower. It is supernatural. It is something that God is creating within us. And we just have to decide, are we going to tap this 
into this superpower. Have you ever heard someone say, I always speak my mind no matter what? You ever hear someone say that? What do you do when you hear something like that? Run. Yeah, you walk away. You just leave that alone because you don't want to be a target. Because basically what that person is saying is, I always say whatever comes to me because I believe for some reason I'm smarter than you. And for some reason I have gained the right to say what's on my mind, whether or not it's useful or not. Whether or not what I say is kind, whether or not what I say reflects the grace of God. I just say whatever I feel like I need to say. It reminds us of a phrase that our parents used to say to us. Think before you speak. Amen. Think before you speak. When it comes to self-control, this is kind of the formula that we have to use. And, and it can't be something that, well, at first, maybe we need to go through this thing step by step. But this has to be natural. When it comes to what I say in self-control, I have to stop. I have to think. I have to ask, what could happen depending, uh, as a result of what I say? And is that what I want? This process has to happen instantaneously in order for us to practice self-control in our communication. There's another phrase that perhaps you've heard. Maybe your parents have Use when you're noisy and loud. They might use the phrase, silence is golden. Have you ever used that phrase, silence is golden? You know, that's only part of that phrase. The entire phrase is, speech is silver, silence is golden. And it was first used by Thomas Carlyle in 1831 in a book that he wrote was kind of a philosophical treatise. And one of the things he was emphasizing in this book is that sometimes we need to be quiet and listen. But we also have to realize that, that our speech is powerful and valuable and is just or almost as important as the silence. Both are of great value to us. Because if we don't practice self-control, things can look like what this, proverbs, what this proverb refers to. Like a city whose walls are broken through is a person who lacks self-control. I love this picture. I, I love... The, the imagery that's, that's communicated here, uh, the device in the background is a trebuchet, right? And it's, a, it's an item with which they can fling big rocks or balls of fiery tar at the enemy's positions and break down the walls. And that's kind of what our words are like. Sometimes what we say is just like we're hurling a stone through through space, and we're breaking down people's walls. And once those walls are broken down, we lose protection. If I'm a person who doesn't have self-control, that's what my life is going to look like. I'll be vulnerable. I'll be open to whatever other attack comes at me. And to think that, that I could change it by my words by what I say. That's a powerful redeeming thought. Self-control is my superpower. If you just journey through the scripture, you're going to find this idea prominent in so many ways. 
This idea of being careful what you say. This idea that my words oftentimes can build a life or destroy a life. James reminds us that we all stumble in many ways. But there's just something about what we say. Just something about stumbling in what we say. And as a matter of fact, he goes further that if we are able to exercise self-control with our words and in our communication, it's going to reflect greater on the bigger picture of our lives and our faith. If anyone does not stumble in what they say, they are a mature person who's also able to control the whole body. What a redeeming thought. What an encouraging thought that I can make this big of a difference in my life and it's, it's kind of a bellwether, I guess, of the rest of my life. If I'm exercising self-control in what I say, then the other aspects of my life are going to look better. They are going to be the evidence of a mature person of faith. It's, a, it's, under, it's important for us to understand that because when we are not exercising self-control in our relationships, things can just get out of control. A couple was having communication problems. And they got to the point to where, and, and they didn't even know what they were fighting about at this point. Someone said something, they responded, and you know, that's, that's how it happens. Somebody says something wrong, somebody responds in a wrong way, and before you know it, you've got this big fight. And so they just went from yelling at each other to the silent treatment. They wouldn't talk to each other. The husband had an early morning flight to catch. And in their family, the wife was the early riser. She was the one who just jumped up and was on fire and alive when, she, when her feet hit the floor. I don't know if you're married to somebody like that. That can be a challenge sometimes. So before they went to bed, he writes a note. It says, I have an early flight. I need to get up at 5 a.m. Please wake me. And he left it on the nightstand next to her side of the bed. The next morning, he gets up. It's 8 o'clock. He's late. He's overslept. He's missed his flight. And he's angry. He's so angry. And his feet hit the floor, and his, he notices a note next to his part of the bed. And the note says, it's 5 a.m., wake up. <laughs> when things like that happen, we're too far down that track. We're too far down that journey. We've already done a lot of damage because we have not thought that it is important to exercise self-control in what we say. And when it comes to relationships, the scriptural virtue that guides all relationships is... Do not look out only for your own interests, but also the interests of others. And that's, that's what relationships are all about. If we're in a relationship and it's a selfish thing, then that's not going to work. And you're going to say whatever you need to say to manipulate and control that relationship. And manipulation and control, that comes from within, right? There's something within that's guiding that. And that's what Jesus reminds us, that, that our words come out of what is already inside of us. What comes out reflects what is inside of us. And that means I need to work on what's inside of me. And I need to realize that the virtue that controls relationships is not what I can get out of it, but whatever is in your better interest. Our world needs to 
understand this truth. And our world needs to see that they are capable of responsible communication. We need to see that we are responsible and capable to have good communication. We need to see it's, it's part of who we are that any human being, if they care about that, can have good communication. Jesus says, bring out the good that is in you. Now, I like what he's saying there because it's an encouragement for us to shoot higher, to have higher goals for our communications. Sometimes people who have good within you, in them, in us, say really bad things. I don't know if there's a mix of bad and good in there. I don't know if they're not seeing the good that's in there. But if you're a child of God, if you are a follower of Christ, the Holy Spirit has been implanted within you. That's good. That's awesome. That is going to transform the inside. And sometimes we just need that encouragement. Let's bring that out. Let's bring that out. Let's bring that good that is within you and bring it out. That means I'm going to have to take ownership of what I say and take ownership of the way I am engaging in communication. There was a man who was worried. He was worried about his wife. And, and he was thinking maybe, maybe she's having problem with hearing. And so she went to talk to a doctor and he said, it seems like when I say stuff, she's just, she's, not that she's not listening, she doesn't hear me. And so the doctor said, I'll, I'll give you this little trick that you can use to figure out what's going on. Stand about 15 feet from her and ask her a question. And if she doesn't hear you, move closer, ask the question again. And so he gets the idea that, you know, he'll see what, what is the distance that I need to have between me and her in order for her to hear what I'm saying. So he, co he goes home, he's... He comes in the house, she's in the, in the kitchen at the sink, she's doing her stuff, getting dinner ready, and he's standing 15 feet away from her, and he, he says, what's for dinner, honey? And he doesn't hear anything. She doesn't respond. And then he walks closer, and he says, what's for dinner? Nothing. A couple feet closer, honey, what's for dinner? Nothing. Nothing. Then he gets just a couple of feet from her and he says, Honey, what's for dinner? And she said, I've told you four times we're having chicken. Her hearing was pretty good. He was the one having the issue. We have to take ownership for the things that we either need to say or need not to say. We need to take ownership, and, and if there's something I need to change, I need to change it. George Bernard Shaw said, the greatest problem with communication is the illusion that it's been accomplished. And even that, that reflects a frustration in communication, I know among couples sometimes, and that is we don't practice active listening techniques. Uh, if you live in a multi-level house, you understand what I mean. Have, have you ever been in one level of the house and asked your spouse a question and your spouse is in the other level and the spouse responds, it's not like they're ignoring you, but you're just physically in two different places. How many of you have tried to have a quality discussion occupying two different levels of your house, house with your spouse? How many of you have, have done that? Yeah. Ah. Eye contact, being and occupying the same space. If you want to talk to that person, 
Talk to that person. And, and be responsible and, and take, take ownership of it. That if I've got something that's worth saying, I'm going to look my wife into the eye, in her eyes. She has two eyes. Look <laughs> into her eyes. And say, honey, what's for dinner tonight? Or whatever it is that I need to ask her. We need to be imitators of God. I thought about this phrase, just be imitators of God. And, and then I went to Ephesians chapter 5, where this phrase is located. And you know that section of scripture is talking about communication. Isn't that amazing? Sometimes we'll take this and we'll think about moral, be morally like God, or we'll think, oh, we need to know God's word and be like God that way, but he's talking about communication. In my Discussions in my relationships to people, I need to imitate God. In the passage that Don Malore read, it begins with just this grandiose, this statement that takes up all heaven and earth. The heavens declare the glory of God. What's that talking about? It's talking about speech. The heavens are communicating to us something about God. The heavens declare, speak, communicate the glory of God. If I'm going to imitate God in my communication, then the goodness of God is going to be reflected in the work of my hands. In in what I do in what my life looks like. The things that define my life are going to communicate who I am. And that's kind of what I mean by it comes from inside of you. What you communicate comes from inside of you. Your life will, and what you create with your life, comes from inside of you and will communicate something. The things that I create with my life the things that define my life. Really, it's who I am. The things that we see in creation are, reflect who God is. And in it, we can see his, his awesome power. We see his love and concern. We see his, his desire for all things that move about on the earth. He loves and cares and has provided for all of us. We we can see that in the creation. Second is the written and spoken word. And, And I think we're losing this one. If you can't say it in 140 characters, then no one else is gonna listen. God communicated to us through his written and spoken word. In it we learn the heart of God, the desire of God, the the principles by which we may live a life that that is pleasing in his eyes. And that works, a life that works. We need to be able to communicate to those that we care about with, with not only spoken words, but with written words as well. I'm so amazed at, at some of the, the ways and some of the cards that, that if you're a, a member of this congregation, you've gotten them too. Sometimes you'll get a card from somebody in this congregation and it looks like you're getting a letter from Paul. You know what I mean? It's just filled with encouragement and truth and love. When we communicate with our words, 
And with what we write, we are being like God. And then finally, through undeniable acts of love. God made the statement once for all in regards to the value of a human being, in regards to uh, who we are, in regards to what he thinks about us. Undeniable what he accomplished on the cross. And I can imitate not necessarily dying on the cross, but I can do things that reflect the undeniable love that has been put into my life because of what I understand to be true because of what Jesus did. Although what Jeff, I love what Jeff said this morning that, you know, I am that dog. And I don't like, I don't like songs. Uh, the one that says, at the cross, at the cross, where I first found the light, talks about such a worm as I. I hate that. I hate that phrase because I'm not a worm. But I'm not worthy. I'm not worthy of that. And it's those things, when I grasp that, that begins to change me on the inside. And when what is inside begins to change, then what comes out changes as well. And remember those words that Jesus said, by our words we will be acquitted, or by our words we will be condemned. We are not just conveying information, but we are imparting life. The words that we say are just not a, a giving of information, and I think that's where we miss it. And we think it's all about just giving information. God didn't just give us information. He gave us life. And our words can do the same thing in our relationships. It's not a mistake that we are in the relationships that we are in. And God expects us to, to make the most of those situations. And our words uh, cannot be taken lightly uh, by any stretch of the imagination. Because with my words, I'm just not conveying information. I'm imparting life. And this morning, I want to encourage you to not to not give up, to not stop growing in your faith, to realize that where we are is where God wants us to be, but there's always, there's always room to grow. There's always room to change. And when we, when we begin to ignore the things that really need to change in our lives, then that's when the good is going to have a hard time coming out. Because what will come out, and it seems like, and there's a self-control, no matter how hard I try, I can't help. And that's why, because it's, it's who you are and it's coming out. So don't, don't ever think that, that you've arrived and that I've got it made. Because there's always things that need to change within you if good is going to consistently come out. And this morning, I want to encourage you, if you haven't taken that step and that change hasn't begun, uh, we can do things through human resolve. We can do amazing things just through simple human resolve. But we can never merit or approach the throne of God without the grace of Jesus Christ. And that, that grace, our transportation into that grace begins in our acceptance of what he did for us. And we, we imitate that death, burial, and resurrection in the baptism. As we die to ourselves, we're buried in the watery grave and raised to a new life. If you need to do that this morning, I encourage you to do that while we stand and sing.